Can I see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Today, lecture three, history and future. So this is out of our text, the little uh, California history, natural history guide, um, out of the little green book. And we're pages 22 through 39. All right. So we're getting, again back to this theme that California's agriculture is so diverse and it's constantly changing. I think we have a feeling we drive by old uh, Farmer McDonald, Farmer McDonald farm and we feel like they've done the same thing the same way forever but agriculture is highly dynamic especially in California the products the variables uh, the weather is constantly changing okay um, but there's been a steady rise in the productivity and also we're always going to be all trying to compete for the very fertile areas where are those areas alongside the rivers where traditionally those rivers would overflow that very fertile silt and deposit would go out and those are the areas well right there we have a conflict because that's where people want to live right San Francisco LA those are all in those floodplains um, in those in those floodplains hopefully not in the same sense as Houston just was okay and then we need to know that the profitability of certain crops changes very quickly. I always tell the story in South Africa. We, would, we were great friends. It was a great community of farmers. But we would literally drive by and, and look what the neighbor farmer was planting because we knew if we planted too many cabbages as a community, we would flood the market. And then the price would go down for everyone, especially the person who planted later or in the same season, same exact same time as others. All right, so seven constants. These are really important. One is to do California agriculture, to do agriculture in general, you have to be an entrepreneur. You've got to really go out there, take some risks. You've got to try new things. And you've got to have a very high level of skill in many different fields. We'll s notice that particularly when we go to the dairy farm. Farm. Uh, Kenny DeFries will talk to us about that, about the multiple skills that he has to have in terms of management and a nutritionist and on and on. Okay, oh, sorry. Resource dependence, highly dependent because it's industrialized agriculture. I'm going to talk about that in, the, in a couple of lectures time. Industrialized, we, we use a lot of energy, we use a lot of water, and we use this very valuable land. It's land that can be used for other things. Um, the second one in California is the absence of water. And this is actually all across the world, really, except for a few exceptions. Water is the key. How do we get the water? It's lovely if you have a trickling brook river running through your property and you could just take the water from there. But most of the times, water has to be brought to the land. And that's what we're going to study here in California, this most intricate hydraulic water delivery system in the world where we collect water off the Sierra Mountains, basically off the snow melt, and we move it around the country, the country in terms of California. Um, we would not exist in California if it wasn't for that. This area wouldn't exist. The biggest state water project comes right through Hesperia. The terminus of that is in Silverwood Lake. And without that, none of us would be able to live here, as many of us would be able to live here, because we would be using up our water supply, which is groundwater. L.A. would literally dry up and, and, uh, and drift away. Okay? Um, agricultural labor is huge. We're going to talk about that at the end of the class, is who's going to do this work? It's very intensive. It's extremely hard work. We're going to talk about who's going to do this work, and then all the labor issues, immigration issues that come from that. Okay, um, There's always going to be a growth in agriculture as the rule, but it's always uh, juxtaposed against the disasters, the economic shocks, and the natural ca catastrophes. Texas, this last little bit, we're talking about the people and homes flooded, but you also have to realize that Things like in, in, in Florida, the, the orange crop was completely devastated. Lots of agricultural products from Texas are going to be completely devastated by that same flood. Uh, technological skills and innovation is, again, this is very similar to the first one, but really focused not so much in innovation in general, but on technology, innovation in technology. 
we have to apply the very latest technology. We will see the very latest technology in waste management systems. The, the feces and the urine from the cattle on that dairy ranch, on those dairy cows, has to be managed because if it goes into the water supply, it causes really serious problems. Okay? And that takes high tech. And that tech is constantly evolving and people need to know how to implement it. Okay, so there's just a picture of high, how high tech these dairies are. One on the left, you see that's a, a, these are a confined feeding operations, a word you guys are going to have to learn. CAFOs or uh, CAFOs or, or CAF, confined animal feeding, and means the cows, the animals, the pigs, the chickens are all brought together in one place under, in a building, under a roof, and then the food is brought to them rather than a traditional way that we think of that you know the happy cow goes out onto the pasture and we're going to talk about that in the bottom there is kind of interesting that's a rotary that's how high tech it is that is a rotary dairy parlor cows go on that the suctions vacuums are put on on the teats to milk them and they rotate around the trick there is much less labor that one person you see there stands in one place and the cows come to them for various parts of that process, rather than them having to walk around to the cows. We're going to see the old, more of the old-fashioned way. Okay. Um, now the history. So, um, of course, it, we go way back to the, the Native Americans. Um, there, there probably were a lot more of them than we've kind of given credit for. Um, and in those days, what, what they were much more about is moving with the food supply, with the rains. When it was dry and hot down in the lowlands, they'd move up into the mountains and follow up the pinyon pines, the pinyon nuts, for example. And, but they had to learn how to preserve these things, right? So had a salmon run. Wouldn't, that wouldn't be locally necessarily, but for California in general. Well, we have to figure out how to smoke that fish to, to preserve it. Okay? They made acorn meal, grass seeds, berries. They stored as much of that as they could. They were hunter-gatherers. Okay? So that's, they're hunting and gathering. They're gathering food as they move around. That means they were transient. Um, they were pretty innovative as well. They started to do, there's some evidence that they started to have irrigation district ditches and move water around, move it from the river over to the land so that they didn't have to depend on a very, very low, unpredictable rainfall, right? We've already talked about this. <clears throat> California, pretty much apart from the very far north, is a semi-desert. And so you're not going to be able to depend on natural rainfall. You're going to have to irrigate, okay? And they started to select various breeding varieties. They use selective breeding. They breed the best corn to the best corn, and maybe hopefully get better corn. Okay, uh, Spanish-Mexican arrival. This is when, when uh, in fifth grade, we'll talk about the missionaries. 21 missions, they landed. They weren't stupid. They landed on the fertile land. Um, whether you look at San Juan Capistrano, just straight down from us here, um, they were actually agricultural colonies, right? They, they were, of course, here to bring the message of the Catholic Church and Christianity, but they're actually an agricultural colony. And that's what brought the people together, okay? Um, and then from there, they branched out to also into extensive livestock ranching. Um, in that time, there was, there was a boom in economy of cattle hides and, and the tallow, the fat. And then, of course, how did they preserve the meat, which was kind of a waste product at that point, well, that was how they came up with the idea of, of drying it, which what we know as is jerky or haiki or something like that, if you pronounce that right. Of course, great news, and uh, if you've had a chance, uh, you get a chance, watch the movie Corazon Vaquero, because these are the people that knew the land and knew they were the early, early uh, livestock professionals and livestock early cowboys, as it were. Right, um, and lots of the big properties that we have in California, like the Hearst Ranch, 
which we think of Hearst Castle, halfway up the coast of California. But there's a massive ranch associated with that, and that comes from these towns, these huge land holdings. The Tejon Ranch, which is basically directly east from here before you get to all around Highway 5 as it goes through the grapevine, there's a massive ranch all across those mountains. And that, that allocation of land comes from these times. Land ownership, as this moved along, we started to transfer to the Anglo set, uh, settlers that were starting to move in. Um, and then the other way the land changed hold hands was grants for the railroads. The railroads, when you put through a railroad, part of the deal is you got a mile of land on either side. So huge tracts of land. And to this day, we're still figuring out how to manage it. Last two years, we've had huge wilderness areas declared out in the Mojave, and that land was able to remain in those blocks because originally it had belonged to the railroads that go out there as you go out on I-40, those railroads that parallel out there. Okay, so this was another major move. As the railroads came in and were put in, they came with this allotment this, uh, of land. Okay. Ranching um, became a lifestyle and a source of income, and I think this is something we need to think about and, and, and talk about. We still in the West here like to wear our cowboy hats and our, and our cowboy boots and all of that. It's a lifestyle, this idea that we can live out like this and have animals is a lifestyle. It's more than just growing food. Okay. So when, when we talk about, well, there are too, many, too much methane, like I heard on BBC last night, too much methane. Methane is supposedly all coming from cow flatulence. Total nonsense, okay? Most of the methane is coming from organic material that's, that's actually fermenting in the ground. And that's more important than that is how do we prevent that from going on our solid waste dumps? That would be a better focus. But of course, it's the news, so they pick up on something silly like that, okay? Um, they were walk to market, so they were cattle drives. It was kind of cool because, you know, you, you, you could grow your animals way out on the range, way up in the San Bernardino Mountain, and then they were walk to markets, which when the gold rush starts, I think the next slide, that was perfect because all of a sudden, rush of people, they needed food. Well, it was easy to drive the cattle to the railroads, a station or drive them actually to where they were going to be used, okay? Um, and then at that time also there were new laws put in place as to how you could acquire land. At one point you could get on a little boat and whatever land you traversed when in the, in the, in the San Joaquin Valley when that was in flood, whatever you traversed became your land and you could basically stake it, stake it out. Um, so, and it created an entirely new California, part Hispanic, part Anglo, um, and it's continued that way, right? We're still, we're still a, a, a mixture of all these different ethnic groups, okay? California Gold Rush, 1849, uh, readiest food was meat on animals, we've already talked about that, and unfortunately, this incredible wildlife that was available, right? For example, in the San Joaquin Delta, that's the Delta, that San Joaquin Sacramento Delta, that massive wetland that goes out behind San Francisco, where 50, through which 50% of California's water flow, there were just ducks and birds and animals galore. And then the very rich ocean. We not only have one of the richest inlands in the world, we also have one of the richest oceans. And folks just went to town. I mean, literally, this was amazing to me as I really found out about this, but these massive punt guns where they could shoot a whole bunch of birds at one time. They're just like a massive shotgun, I imagine. And that on the right, if you can believe it, over there on the right is a pile of birds. I, I, can't, I can't quite fathom that. <laughs> That's... That's beyond belief. There's a person down in that bottom corner there. Okay, uh, but there was no refrigeration, so things had to be, um, start to be produced locally. So that's when we started to really farm for, 
for produce in the, in the Sacramento Valley. And of course, the market drives and the weather um, produced problems, because just as it does today, when there was several great floods and they realized the California climate was so variable, and that's when we started to really start manipulate it. One of the ways we manipulated it is by having these big irrigation systems where we could get water to places that otherwise would have been completely dry in a semi-desert where you couldn't have grown anything. Okay, um, Urbanization. So again, back to those seven, those seven big focuses. This is a big deal for California. California, um, lots of this infrastructure was developed for agriculture, like the water infrastructure, but it's people that have taken advantage of it, right? So we're constant... I talk about it as a competition between food and people. Are we farming people or are we farming food? And it's a balance um, in there. We're still always trying to find that balance. Um, okay, so land ownership changes, land speculation, new kinds of, of, of wheat, and, and, and again, this innovation going on in terms of, of the of finding new crops and that'll work. And the Durham wheat was a big story in the lower San Joaquin Valley, Bakersfield and that kind of area, um, which was so productive and so in demand that that monopolized the world's market for, for wheat for a while. Okay, uh, irrigation colonies. Um, again, people coming together because that's where you could make a living. That's where you could farm. That's where you could find work around these irrigation districts, they're called. And those still exist today. Very powerful organizations. They're cooperatives of farmers and others, like, for example, the Imperial Valley Irrigation District down there. It was in the news a lot in the last few years because they decided to sell off their water holdings, some of their water holdings, to San Diego. San Diego just didn't have enough water for its growth. Those canals that bring the water, in that case, from the Colorado River, come right through the Imperial Valley. And they were originally designed to supply water for agriculture. Now they've sold it to San Diego. Well, that's cool, but food prices probably will go up in the long run. Second thing is the Salton Sea is going to dry up because it was the runoff from that agricultural water that was keeping the Salton Sea full. Now we've got this huge ecological disaster looming of the, of the Salton Sea, if it dries up, produces very toxic dust that would <coughs> automatically blow in towards LA, towards Riverside. That's the prevailing winds, right? And so we're trying to figure out how do we save the Salton Sea? Because it's also a huge area where birds overwinter, the mi end of migration for things like the snow geese. If you ever want to see one of the natural wonders of the world, go down and see those snow geese starting about now. They'll start coming in in their hundreds of thousands into the Salton Sea. That's quite astounding. Um, so, uh, of course, the, the, the ugliest seg segments, uh, exploitation of labor, banning of Chinese from owning land, devastation of ecology. These are all early parts where we, we didn't have infrastructure in place to protect the labor force, to conserve the environment, and now we do. And now, it's a, now we have to balance this all out. You know? So literally today, we're forced to say, okay, 41% of our water goes to agriculture. 39% goes to the environment, and that means we have to keep these systems working. Certain rivers that have salmon runs on them, we have to make sure there's enough water left in there so they can actually have the salmon run. Then 20% of our water goes to urban. Well, those people have a very loud voice. Imagine if we suddenly said to LA, hey, sorry, there's not enough water in the California aqueduct. We're just going to cut your water supply by 50%. Okay? Almost came to that two years ago when the governor had to step in and said, I'm going to put mandatory water saving conservation uh, requirements on all the different parts of California for urban water. Um, and it worked. People did a good job of, of, and locally we have several programs we'll be looking at, cash for grass, where they'll actually pay you to take out extra lawn and grassy areas that you probably don't need. Okay? 
Um, some weird stuff that goes along with this um, mining also caused devastation of, that's a riverbed that you're looking at there, and this hydraulic mine, mining where they tap the water way upstream, build up tremendous pressure, and then they had these huge uh, fire hoses looking things and they would blast them into these hillsides and knock that out and then take the gold that would come out of that, right? They would sift the gold or whatever you call it out of that. But they destroyed the structure of those riverbeds, which to still today are a problem. Because again, what does that do for a salmon run? What does that do for the quality of the water? Because now it's all got a bunch of sediment and dirt in it. Okay. Um, a hydraulic society, we've talked about that a little bit. We'll come back to that. We pump water, we store it, we move it. Over 20% of our energy is used just to move water around the state. Um, and then we, on the other side, we are a Mediterranean climate. It rains in the wintertime. Well, be much nicer, much better if it rained in the spring and summertime when we're growing our crops. So we have to allow for that. And then, of course, droughts. Okay, Hydraulic society, there's your 41, 38, 20, somewhere in those areas. There's 1%. If you're a good mathematician, you'll see there's 1% missing in that little calculation. So we normally say 41% to agriculture, 39% envi environment, 20% urban. Okay, So labor, um, you know, part of the history is the displaced labor from Oklahoma where they had destroyed their natural resource system. They <clears throat> basically overgrazed, overused their land. They, they had a period of drought and basically all their topsoil, all the place they could grow anything blew away. And so economies and people's lives blew away, literally. A lot of those people moved to California. Uh, Tulare Lake effectively disappeared. So one of my favorite things in the whole world is, is water and, and rafting and canoeing and kayaking. And we spend some time on the, on the Kern River. So over here, going over towards a place called Kernville, Lake Isabella. Incredible river that starts up at Mount Whitney and flows down the middle of the Sierras, literally. And it's, a, it's quite a magnificent river, actually. Uh, grade 5 rapids, it's, it's an incredible river, but it empties, it turns right and goes towards Bakersfield and empties out in that huge San Joaquin Valley. And it used to empty out into these huge lakes and wetlands and swamps. Well, we basically drained that because we wanted to put agriculture in there. So today, if we have a very wet year, it's quite a problem for them down there because they're still, they got to find a place for all that water to go. Okay. And part of that is kind of fortunate because they've also found a, they also recharge the groundwater down there. And that's a water banking system that we can use later on. We can pull that water out and put it back in the California aqueduct and send it up here through Hesperia. So we can actually work that both ways. But a very complicated system, again, this hydraulic society of how we store and move water around. Impacts of urbanization. Um, so yeah, it, as people went out into the suburbs, as these big cities moved, they moved lots of industries out of the way. The dairy industry, the citrus industry, all had to move inland and then ultimately move to other places. So dairy industry is just basically wrapping up its time in down the LA basin, mostly in Chino. And they're moving up this way. The farm that we would we visit, uh, Hinkley Dairy, is used to be down there in Chino. Okay, um, there's an urban shift in in any place you looked, um, and there's it's also based on you can keep moving to stay away from this urban growth, and of course it it's quite enticing to the farmers because farmers can produce X amount per acre on the land doing dairy or doing oranges. But when they sell out to a developer for homes, they make millions and prawn billions sometimes. Um, so people move, but eventually they're going to get out of the zone. You can't grow oranges up here. So if your farm that produced citrus in, in LA 
gets bored out, you can't come up here and grow oranges because we're too cold. We, we have frost. Okay. Um, Agribusiness, a big part of this. We started, it became highly industrialized. It became a huge business. Um, and we also did a lot of the local research. Here. And we were part of what's called the first green revolution that we're going to talk about two lectures from now, where we hybridized plants, we grew plants to be highly productive. We used big technology. We started using pesticides. We started using synthetic fertilizers. These are all part of the industrialization ag towards what is now, you know, in general, agribusiness. And that's part of the history of California. We actually led a lot of that innovation, if you want to call it that. It was innovation. It's just now we're looking back and saying, was that worth it? Is there better, more sustainable ways of doing this? And that's called sustainable agriculture. Okay. Um, so state officials, for example, started to regulate and, and started and urbanization benefited from the subsidizing of irrigation. This, these irrigation systems, these canals, these dams are put in, and the farmers never really ended up paying for them. So well, then when the city comes in, they never end up paying for them. And those are all bonds, loans from the government that actually never got paid back. Okay? Um, and then, you know, part of this is we start exploiting laborers. And one of the, the key labor movements was started because of this, right? Uh, Robert Kennedy was involved. Cesar Chavez uh, was involved in starting the United Farm Workers Union, where they pushed back and said, no, we have rights. We, we need to be treated fairly and equitably. Okay, again, what's that second sphere of of sustainability, social health, equity. Okay. Um, large agricultural commodities in California are still to this day cattle and calves, that's the largest, dairy is the biggest, grapes, almonds, lettuce, strawberries, tomatoes, nursery products, and floriculture, growing flowers. Um, of course, now the unspoken one, which since this slide was done, now the spoken one. Now we, that we've legalized marijuana, this area right here is going to become very, very uh, big in that industry. Adelanto is pushing very hard to become a leader in that area. I just heard a few months ago, and I haven't checked it out, but the huge Heilig Myers industrial building up here on the 15 is being turned over into a massive indoor hydroponics marijuana production facility. And we've had inquiries here at the college. Do you train people in propagation? Yes, we do. And the reason they're asking that, it's because they're asking that these people that work there and run these things are certified to be able to do this stuff. Okay? Um, market innovation and alternative agriculture. Um, we're always looking for new ways of doing things. Um, the Dutch specialized in milk and cheese and dairy products. So a lot of the folks that are dairy farmers, you'll notice they have Dutch names, like our friend out here is Kenny de Vries. You guys would say in Americanization, you'd say Kenny de Vries. Um, that's a Dutch name. And so they did that. The Basques were very part there from Spanish, from Spain. They were very involved in the, in the sheep industry. The Italian Americans were very involved in the winemaking area, okay, especially in Sonoma and Napa. Um, okay, right, market innovation. Uh, always there's new ideas. Um, we in crop marketing, pistachios have just really made a big push over the last few years. You'll see lots of pistachios. Apparently, avos, avocados, right there. Um, their growth can, in California and the United States can be directly attributed to marketing around the super mall and guacamole. Apparently, that just they sell more avos than you can think of at that time. And that kind of put them on the, to the front and, and, and in the forefront in terms of a, of a commodity, an agricultural commodity. Okay? Um, so talking about pseudo-subsidies, again, um, we don't necessarily subsidize farming for something, or government, well, subsidy is the government paying you to do something. 
but because they get free water, that, that's a pseudo subsidy. Um, and in general, we're looking at now, we're trying to innovate and have subsidies towards sustainable agriculture, to technologies that work. So what we're gonna see, for example, out there, and we'll have a lecture on this, out in Hinkley, we'll see these irrigation systems that um, are very innovative and they use very little water. They're these big boom systems that you've seen go around in a circle. This one goes linearly, but it actually drags a drip line behind it. And so the water goes right where it's needed in the alfalfa. And it's over 95% efficient. The old system of flood irrigating was 50% efficient. We were wasting 50% of the water. So that's an example of a government subsidy. U.S. Department of Agriculture will subsidize the farmers, give them money to help them to buy those systems. That's a subsidy towards sustainable agriculture. And that's it. Thank you very much.